Hello, my name is Tim Russell, Vice President, Community Engagement and Diversity, Equity and Inclusion for WTTW WFMT. On behalf of the University of Chicago Crown Family School of Social Work, Policy and Practice, and the University of Chicago Inclusive Economy Lab, welcome to Firsthand Living in Poverty, Equity and Education. Today's event is part of Firsthand Living in Poverty event series. WTTW is delighted to partner with both the Crowns Family School and the Inclusive Economy Lab because we share a, co a commitment to lifting up the voices and stories of Chicagoans who are creating a more equitable society. This is the most recent event in an ongoing partnership between the school and WTTW, and we look forward to many more to come. WTTW is committed to producing and presenting trusted best-in-class content fueled by distinctly Chicago sensibility. We have served as Chicago's window to the world, and our purpose is to enrich lives, engage communities, and inspire exploration. Through our broadcast and digital platforms, we educate and entertain children and families and share the stories of women and men who have influenced Chicago, America, and the world. Where national news coverage and conversations about our region often dissolve into stereotypes and generalizations, WTTW is uniquely positioned to tell these important stories from nuanced, firsthand human perspectives. In firsthand living in poverty, we meet people experiencing uh, or dedicating their lives to alleviating intergenerational poverty. In firsthand living in poverty, we present a documentary series, reported texts, expert talks, and community discussions with a supporting discussion guide, all of which can be found on wttw.com slash firsthand. Community engagement for firsthand living in poverty is made possible by the Caris Foundation, Inc. I would also like a special thanks to our supporters. Lee's support for firsthand living in poverty is provided by the Granger Foundation and Becky and Lester Knight, the Knight Family Foundation. Major support is also provided by Jim and Kay Maybe, Randy and Carrie McMillan, Butler Family Foundation, Denny and Sandy Cummings, the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Foundation, Lou Collins, Edwardson Family Foundation, Mark and Jean Malnati Family Foundation, Kristen and Carlson Vogan and Sean Vogan and the Duncan family. I hope you leverage WTTW's firsthand living in poverty to engage your community around this issue, which is impacting our community. Now, let's watch a trailer to firsthand living in poverty. I need money to move out. I need money for a car. I need money to get my license. But I mean, if I look at it all like that, I get overwhelmed. I couldn't even buy my kids nothing for Christmas because I had to choose between making that car payment or getting them something. It's like you worrying and you going through day-to-day -day life with so much that you face with. I feel like I'm constantly playing catch up all the time. I'll get so far and then something else will get thrown at me. I don't want my kids to feel like they stuck in a trap. You know, I want them to go see the world. I want to get out of the neighborhood. I want to get my family out of the neighborhood. Sometimes when you're a mother, you just have to keep pushing no matter what. I love my daughter. I know she loves me. I want a better life for her. I look to God to take care of me and my family. I know some way, somehow, that he'll make a way for me to make ends meet. I took the opportunity that was given and built something a little better out of it. I try to remain optimistic, and somebody's going to say, I'll give you a chance. You failed. It's OK. Get back up. It's not in the falling. It's in the getting back up that makes you who you are. Welcome, I'm Dan Protess, executive producer of WTTW series, First Hand Living in Poverty. And I'd like to welcome our guests now, Z Scott, who is the president of Chicago State University, Juan Salgado, the chancellor of City Colleges of Chicago, Shante Robinson, the assistant pr professor at University of Chicago Crown Family School of Social Work Policy and Practice, and Dominitrius Chambers, who's one of five people featured in our firsthand Living in Poverty documentary series, which you can watch at wttw.com slash firsthand. And while you're there, you can also check out a talk by Juan Salgado about community colleges as a pathway out of poverty 
thank you all for being here. See, Scott, let's start with you. In Illinois, there are stark disparities in college attainment between white students and their black and Latino counterparts. And, and even more troubling is that the gulf is actually growing. Is that right? Yes. Uh, as we look at the data from the Illinois Department of Higher Education and we compare that data over the past few years, we've seen since 2013 a 29% drop in Black student enrollment in our public universities in Illinois. Many would say that this is a crisis level, and I agree uh, it is a crisis statistic for Illinois. And to what do you attribute that growing gulf? You know, first of all, you know, many of us have, bec have, have become very comfortable and should be comfortable with the idea that systemic racism permeates every system and that racism is no stranger to higher education. So that we believe that there are policies and practices in place that are obstructing and challenging Black student access to education in Illinois. And I hope to get to a lot of those barriers in this conversation. Let's start uh, by talking about what we can do as a state to, to achieve equity of access to college for our high school students in Illinois. Shante Robinson, you say there's a tendency for high school teachers and counselors to say that college isn't for everybody. Why is the way in which high school school and uh, high school staff uh, talk about college important? You are muted, Shante. There we go. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Thank uh, you. That is a, it is a problem when counselors, administrators, and teachers tell young people that college isn't for everyone. I do believe they're telling certain segments of our population that trope. And then on the other side, they're also telling them, you're not gonna get very far without a college education. Or they, they're very quick to talk about, you know, people with college education, over their lifetime make over a million dollars more than those without a college education. So when we tell young people that college isn't for everyone, but we hear them also telling others that college is for them, or they hear these, these labor statistic numbers where we hear people are making much more money when they have a college education, associate's degree, anything beyond high school, young people really don't know what to do with that. And I think they start to internalize that and say, well, what's wrong with me if people are telling me that college isn't necessarily for me? And does that mean that I'm destined to have a life where I don't make as much money? Or what else can I do in order to make up for that, that deficit? So Shante, high school students need to be academically prepared for college, but they also need to be ready for the uh, less structured environment of college. What can high schools do to better prepare students for the culture of college? I think openly and honestly talking about what college is like, uh, talking about the challenges that we had, as, as well as the fun parts. I think Hollywood does a really great job of telling us what the fun parts of college could possibly be, even if they're exaggerated in some ways. But I don't think we talk about the long nights that you stay up writing those papers, the many hours you spend in a biology lab, just, just working with others, doing the work. Um, and and I also think that we need more black and brown teachers telling these stories, because I think whoever is going through that experience, it differs based on where you're from, where you're from culturally, where you're from geography, uh, based on geography. So we need more black and brown teachers telling black and brown young people what they can expect when they go to these spaces, talking to their families about what they can expect their child to go through when they leave the state and enter a different culture altogether, not just another state, another city, but a different culture, right? So college wasn't necessarily created and modeled for black and brown culture. And so we have to ready young people for that and provide them support to be successful once they are there. Juan Salgado, you're the chancellor, of course, of City Colleges. Your students uh, often have responsibilities beyond their education, whether it's work or caring for family. What can you do to convince them that they can juggle school with everything else they have going on in their lives as you're talking to prospective students who are now in high school? Yeah, I, I appreciate uh, being on this uh, panel and the opportunity that we have to discuss this matter. Uh, the reality is it's, it's beyond convincing. It's about supporting. I mean, we have to be caring campuses. 
in every way. It is about the academics, but it's about all of the supports that come along with the academics. And those supports are of equal importance. And if we're going to be successful with our students, we need to see the wellness center and the advising and the tutoring and the disability access center and the, those kinds of supports that exist um, for our students on our campus as, 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 as crucial elements to student belonging um, and success. And I do also think that we, we need to have, you know, what Chante talks about the relationship that high school counselors need to have with students in introducing the college experience. Actually, we need to be the ones helping to the students to understand better, not going in to recruit them, right? To come to our, you know, you know, colleges and universities as much as we are preparing them for the experience. And you told me that uh, among the high school seniors who express an interest in going to city colleges, only about a quarter actually end up attending. What happens over that summer after high school uh, where there's so much fall off? There is a tremendous, you know, the, 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 what they traditionally call summer melt, right, for many, many students. And, uh, you know, what we're looking at is solutions. And it's a simple solution we've, we've found to uh, be, be fruitful. It's relationships. <laughs> we need to forge relationships with students uh, before they graduate uh, from high school. And then we need to help them navigate the post-secondary process. And so we've begun something called the post-secondary navigators, not advisors. These are staff from city colleges going into public schools uh, in, in partnership with CPS. And, and our intent is to reach every public school through these navigators uh, and ensure that every student has a navigator that has expressed an interest. Last year we did this and we saw an increase from that 27% to over 47% of students that had a navigator ended up matriculating. And so um, we're going to keep getting better at this, but it's about relationships. It's about caring for students. Dominitrius uh, Shante, Professor Robinson was talking about how there should be someone in high schools, a counselor or a teacher saying, you can do it, you should go to college. Was there someone in your life who did that for you? Yes, I did. Um, well, hi, my name is Dominitrius. I'm glad to be here. Um, in my high school year, I did have that one um, teacher that was always helping us with um, scholarships, always helping us with um, work that needs to be done. As far as um, going to college, he always motivated us to um, do what we need to do, like telling us the right thing. And she showed us, like, she was that role model to her senior class. Um, I did. Her name was Miss G, and I love her, like. She did everything she could for us. And was this Miss G's job or do you always kind of feel like this? She was going above and beyond and doing this for her students. I don't think it was our job. She just did it out of love, you know, um, getting faster than like you got to do faster every um, year. I told her and she made sure like if you just even if you not even in high school, like she still check on us. We still could call her. We still to like tell her, sit down and have a meeting about FAFSA and whatever college decision we want to make. She always there to, um, to support us. Wonderful. And FAFSA is the federal financial aid form, which I gather there are a lot of struggles getting those films, those forms filled out. Z, yeah. Z Scott, uh, you suggest that one of the keys to helping prepare high school students for college is to increase access to dual enrollment programs where they attend high school on a, a college campus. Aside from the academic benefits, how does this help them prepare for college? First of all, you, uh, it, it is, uh, again, the academic benefits are, are real. Uh, any, it has been proven that students who have a college going experience while they're in high school are more likely to go to college. Just like city colleges, Chicago State offers dual enrollment opportunities for our students. But we went one step further in bringing students to our campus. We also had weekend programming for students and fam families on how to afford college, college completion, what it means to be on a college campus. So when a student came on our campus, we wanted them to experience 
the idea of being in a classroom, being successful alongside of other college students. And what we saw when we put students through these experiences, the majority of students who were in our dual enrollment program, high school students, received a B or better, not only just in the class, but the, we were also offering those structural supports, peer mentoring inside of the classroom, tutors available outside of the classroom, technology support if the student needed, new student needed. So you started out with offering the wraparound support that really gave a student a sense of college. And what we heard from students is the experience gave them a sense that I can go to college. And Dominitrius, you were a good uh, high school student. You got a full scholarship to a college in South Carolina. Uh, so it mm -hmm. wasn't, you didn't have academic challenges necessarily, did, but did you feel like you were prepared for the culture of college? Um, my honest opinion, I don't feel like I was prepared. Um, I think in um, high school, teach us the stuff that like college teach, like they were just giving us baby steps, you know? Um, and when we in college is like real, real like situations that we never got taught and like we filled along. And I just feel like high school could have did better with that, like making us feel comfortable, making us feel secure. And when I got to college, I was along, like the academic system was so messed up and the support center was like, wasn't there, you know? Well, I think we should try to get at specifically what was uh, in your words, messed up about the system for you. Uh, let's take a minute now to watch some of Dominitrius's story, which you can again watch at WTTW.com slash firsthand. In this clip, we'll see that she went to Benedict College in South Carolina, where she ran into some bumps in the road during the uh, spring break of her freshman year. Hey, Dick. Hey, cousin. Hey, cousin. Hey, cousin. Hey, cousin. Hey, cousin. You start school already? Let me tell you about my I got, I got Monday. Good it's over with. Hey, I got straight A's right now. I got an A plus. I got a B plus. I got a C. Plus. School is important because without a diploma or a degree, you will not get in no job. And I would like to start a career, something that I can make some out of my life. And that's what my mama and my grandma want to see. It's important to my mom and my grandma because they never got the chance to experience graduating out of high school or going off to college. So I think they don't want us to follow their footsteps. They just wanted us to just go off and do what's best for us. Me and my sister was the first one to go off to college. We went to Benedict College in Columbia, South Carolina. College was really fun. But I had my times when I struggled, I had my breakdown. You think you got all the support, but when in reality, you see that life really hit you. Like you by yourself, you on your own. And I wasn't ready to be on my own at the time. I realized that I was coming back to Chicago is when it was springtime. Everybody left campus. I'm in my dorm alone. I was just thinking like, I can't do it. When I got back to Chicago, my mom was like, what you mean you ain't going back? She was just like, why? And I told her, it's not for me. At first she was mad, but at the same time, she was like understanding like why, why we really left. Shantae Robinson, uh, in that clip, we heard Dominitrius say that she felt like college was not for me. Um, are universities responsible for sending signals specifically to students of color that college isn't for them? I'm not sure. I think colleges really want really good students. And I think colleges and universities want to be good matches for their students. Um, and I think there is a really good college match for every young person. I don't think there are navigators and people there to help them decide what that is at the right time. I also don't think when you, when you get into a college and you realize, okay, this isn't the place for me, who do you talk to about 
how to find out where is the perfect place, a better perfect place for you? Where could you go? What does a transfer process look like? What does it mean for my financial aid? Um, who's going to help me through that process? And I think that's where the support ends, that once colleges realize that you're no longer with them, then they have no responsibility to sort of help you find what that place is for you. And a lot of young people end up going back to their homes and then not continuing, particularly with the four-year degree, but even going to the local city colleges. Sometimes they don't do that because they feel like something's wrong with them. They internalize not being able to make it on those particular college spaces. So how do we address that if a student decides that a college is not right for them? It's clearly not in the university's best self-interest to spend money to advise them to go to another college. How do we deal with that? Um, I think it is in the college university's best interest to, to still help those students who have realized that that space isn't the right place for them, that, that there are advisors and other folks who can lend an ear to listen and can also offer advice as to this is the transfer process. And it's not necessarily a, a laborious, difficult process in most cases, but it is one that you need to know about and know how to navigate in order to do it and do it well. Uh, so I love what Chancellor Salgado said about uh, the navigators that are being put in every high school. That is a wonderful idea. And it'd be great if colleges and universities also have those folks for people who, who don't feel that that space is the right place for them. And truly, I think it, it helps more than, than just those students who, who don't feel out, of, who feel out of place because of race or, or gender or, or any of these social sort of constructions. It also helps those who the space just isn't right for whatever reason, right? When we help those who think we're helping the marginalized, we actually end up helping everyone because everyone can benefit from having a college university space that's right for them. Chancellor Salgado, you were the first in your family to go to college, and you say that at first you felt intimidated by the classes in your four-year university. Can you talk about that? Well, I uh, it, probably insecurities, <laughs> uh, which is a natural thing for a student to have. Um, you know, I was intimidated by uh, young people who uh, talked about their ACT scores, which was substantially higher than mine, <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, felt like I didn't belong for a few, uh, uh, for a beginning of a term. Uh, you know, I was fortunate. I had access to uh, faculty, and I think this is really important. We often think about advisors as critical people. Faculty are the critical people. Um, you see them every day, uh, you know, you're struggling in their classes, uh, and they pointed me to uh, tutoring, they pointed me to uh, their office hours, uh, and uh, they pointed me to the multicultural center, uh, and all of those things helped me to realize that I was just as good, just as capable. Uh, and I think that's the turning point for students. I think they have to feel that and internalize that to actually uh, meet with success. And so now as chancellor of city colleges, how does that experience inform your thinking about the kinds of resources that students need? Yeah, I, I think again, um, you know, let me just speak to Dominitrius who's one of our students. You know, you're not alone, okay? That's the other thing. 25% um, of our students are coming back from a four year university, right? And so I think the first message is you're not alone. You know, there are many people out here that want you to succeed, that are here for you to succeed. I think isolation becomes a challenge that we need to solve for. And so, and it, it, it's the student who chooses who they will listen to and attach to. And so we have to have enough people reaching out to the student, offering assistance so that they can take the assistance from the place that is most important. You know, we're uh, running campus, Caring Campus Initiative at our various campuses so that our entire campus communities can truly become caring campuses. And we think we're good at this. We need to be great. We need to be exceptional at being the kind of caring campuses where Dominitrius and her fellow students can find that person and find that service. 
Um, you know, the students know sometimes what's available. It's sometimes intimidating. You know, I, I remember going to the tutoring session for the first time, right? I was scared, okay? Scared to show how little I knew <laughs> um, to another person on campus who was a student too. Um, there's a lot that's intimidating about higher education. We have to understand that and help students through that. President Scott, at Chicago State, you offer what you call intensive advising to make sure students don't fall through the cracks. What does that look like? You know, intensive advising means that advisor is tasked with staying in touch with students. I mean, because we are looking at data and data shows that if you touch a student one time each week, they're more likely to be retained in your school. So intensive advising means really engaging with the students about their need, needs and their desires and what, what is impacting them. And we intend on, we've trained our advisors on this model of intensive advising. We've even had uh, philanthropic support to revise our advising mo model so that it is more intensive in, get, in engaging with students. And one thing I wanted to, to add to uh, Chancellor Salgado's statement, the majority of Chicago State student population is transfer students. 45% of our students come from someplace else. And it, 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 the story behind that is college really is about fit. You know, people can tell you all about, you know, this IV, that IV, and we're in out of state, you know, versus in state. It really is about fit. And counselors need to start having a conversation with students about what exactly they want in from that college experience and really think about fit. So, you know, so you don't think about, uh, can I go to school at Chicago State University where there is a dormitory on campus? And so if I wanna have a kind of campus experience, I can be in the dorm five days a week and perhaps go home on the weekends so that I'm not so far from my family and I'm not so far from that family culture. Or do I need smaller classrooms where I can go someplace like Chicago State where the student teacher ratio is one student per one of 10 students for each faculty member so I can get that personalized support rather than being in a lecture hall with 500 other students on some of our larger campuses. So I think, you know, it's really, as, as, as Chancellor Salgado said, it's about not so much, you know, the academics will, it will be on every campus, but it's also that, that those things that, that, that Chancellor Salgado talked about, like the resource centers that offer additional support that really keep a student grounded in that education and that experience. Dominitrius President Scott said their advisors try to reach out to students once a week and that that makes a difference. When you were in college in South Carolina, did you feel like they were reaching out to you? Were they pestering you once a week or did you feel like you had to find them? They didn't reach out to no student. Um, even if you did try to reach out to them, like there would be like days or weeks later, or if you try to send an email, they would not, um, they would not email you back. And it was just, it was just sad. So when I did leave, it was just like, the support system wasn't like there. And when I went to Math on Max, um, the support system was there, like the mentor and the advisors, like they was, getting everything I need, like I could come to my professors and talk to them. And that's something that I was looking forward to in college. Like you want to have that relationship with a professor and get to know them. And if you need help with anything, that's what um, Malcolm X College did for me. So. And you um, actually mentioned, to, you mentioned to me that your advisor at Malcolm X uh, is now texting you, which seems like a good idea to, to yeah. reach out to students. Uh, by text. Yeah, she set up, um, we just set up um, appointments when I need tutoring and help with anything I need help with with school. Uh, professor Robinson Juan Salgado mentioned the role of professors and being proactive and reaching out to students. You told me about your own experiences as an undergrad that you had professors, uh, specifically African American professors, who you felt like went way above and beyond to make you feel welcome on campus. Talk about that and how that made a difference for you. Absolutely. It made a difference for me as well as uh, countless of other generations of of young black and brown students. Uh, the amount of attention, dedication, love and care 
that I received from uh, the Mullins. I'm talking about UNC Astro. So those who, who know UNC Astro will know Dwight and Dolly Mullen, they'll know the Jameses. Uh, those, those names are sort of iconic in that space because for, for anyone coming to that undergraduate institution and needing that support, they were there. And it's not just the academic support, which they provided to all of their students, but I'm talking about support as in, we know that young people need to be nourished, not only academically, but socially and spiritually and culturally. And they would pick us up and take us to church if we wanted to go to church. They would take us up and take us out to a dinner you know, every once in a while, just so we didn't have to eat on campus every day the whole time that we're there. They made sure that during breaks, we all had someplace to go, even if it was to their house. So it's it's asking a lot of black and brown faculty to do that in addition to all of the other requirements that they have to do for their jobs, right? So not only do they have to publish and teach and do service, they also have to be these navigators and, and almost family members to a host of sometimes dozens of students, uh, sometimes more than a dozens of students. And, and so when we put that type of, of stress and additional responsibility that these people don't do because they're asked to do, they do because the need is there. They do because students need them to do that. And so it was done for them, it was done for me. And so now I'm doing it for my students. And yes, it is an additional stress, and it's one that 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 comes unpaid. It comes un, un uh, you know you don't get tenure for being really great to your students, uh, and that's okay because if my students go on and pay it back in whatever way they do in the future, then that's my reward for that, and because it was done for me. Uh, but we have to also be cognizant of what we're asking of our faculty members and how that's unduly asking of them what is not asked of majority faculty members, of faculty members who can sort of leave their jobs at, 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 their, at their job uh, and don't have to do those extra cultural things with students. Um, it's something we need to be cognizant of. And I think the more black and brown faculty you have, the more that is that weight is distributed. Let's take a minute now to watch some more of Dominitrius's story, uh, which again, you can watch at WTTW.com slash firsthand. In this clip, we'll see uh, that she came home from college in South Carolina, in part because she has a really strong support system here at home in Chicago. Going to college, that helps you see the world so much better. Like, it really helped me because I don't, I don't like depending on nobody. Mm -hmm. Lady is a person that I can always go to whenever I need something, whenever I'm um, going through something. Lady is always there by my side. And when I was in college, that <laughs> built my backbone. That is why I go hard the way I go hard now. Because I don't want nobody saying, oh, you won't have that if it won't. No, I got that because of me. me. Yeah, I'm, she's I'm, somebody I look up to all the time because she strives for success, and she's a hard worker. I let the wrong thing distract me. Like, I let other things, like, pull me down, which pull my grades down, which pull my confidence down, which pull my motivation down. But I didn't stop. Right. I kept going. Even when you have bumps in your road or even when you feel like you just can't go to the next step, you got to keep going. And I'm going to stop talking because I'm finna cry. Oh. <laughs> She was my support back in Chicago, and I was like, I'm going to go back. I'm going back. This is where I need to be. I feel good that I actually came back because I have support. I didn't have it when I was back in South Carolina. I didn't know what I was doing down there, so now I can have the support I need to get where I'm at. I learned from my mistakes I did in South Carolina. I had a whole year to reflect on that. I grew a lot. I'm giving college another try. I got to do better. I got to become better. Because I know my family counting on me. They really counting on me to like get that degree. So I know I got to I got to do. I got to come back hard. So Dominitrius, you are at Malcolm X now. What are you studying? I'm studying uh, sports management. 
Excellent. And you and your sister were the first in your family to attend college. So, and Lady, of course, is a recent college graduate. What kind of advice was she able to give you because she had been through the college experience? Um, the advice she gave me was never give up. Um, even when things get hard, always go, like always keep going. And by her going to the same college that we first went to and by her graduating from that, she was just like very supportive. So, like if you want to come back home, you can't, it's never like too late to start college. Or if you feel like you need to take a year off and reflect on it, then do so. And that's something like I, I needed to hear that because I felt like I was failing at the time. Like if I stopped going, would my family look at me any different? And she showed me like, would nobody hate you? Would nobody stop loving you because of what you're doing is your decision. You always got to make your decision for yourself and not for nobody else. And that was the advice that she always gave us. Professor Shante Robinson, how can universities formalize this kind of informal mentorship that Dominitrius has been receiving? That's a great question. How do we create institutional supports that mimic the type of supports that students may have been getting in their homes, in their local communities, and in their schools that they're coming from? Uh, one of the things we could do is start paying upperclassmen to mentor students who are just coming in, right? That upperclassmen have a wealth of knowledge. They've already navigated a lot of these spaces. And I think most of them would be more than willing to take on two or three undergrads to say, okay, I'm gonna help this person do that if they are paid for their time and their energy. That we have to recognize that, that a lot of these students are already doing that free of charge and it is work. It is spending their time and energy that they could be spending doing a, a, a job or working uh, in, in their academic spaces, but they're talking to freshmen who are just coming in. Let's make that formalized. Let's, instead of having student ambassadors that we pay to take parents and students in high school on these, these campus tours, which is fine and wonderful, but we also need to have these, these upper-class mentors who can tell these young people, don't give up. You know, I was where you were two years ago. Heck, sometimes I'm in that space now. <laughs> you know, we can, we can build some camaraderie around where we are in this very unique academic space. And I get paid, right, a living wage. I get paid a decent dollar an hour to sit with you and help you navigate these spaces. And then you pay that forward by when you become an upperclassman, you get paid to also help someone else navigate that space. President Scott, at Chicago State, you have something called Rise Academy. Is that right? Where the uh, for the first five weeks of their freshman year, students kind of ease their way into college. Uh, t tell us about that. Well, first of all, you know, we looked at uh, how we could improve the uh, retention data for our freshman students, where we found that that is sort of the, the time, it, as Dominique, Dominitris talked about, where you really don't have that sense of belonging and, and you're the most vulnerable as a student. So we started something called the Rise Academy and students enter our enter, uh, college in the summer through a five week academy called the Rise Academy. And during the Rise Academy, they take a, a credit bearing three hour course that they select. They, are, they also are given lectures on financial literacy, leadership, belonging, and getting ready for that college experience. The RISE uh, Academy also includes a laptop, internet access if the student is not, doesn't have it available at home. We're trying to put in, give the students the tools so that when they transition to that fall college experience where they're taking between 12 and 15 hours, they're more prepared. We've already, our early data has already shown us that students who came through Chicago State's RISE Scholars Program are being retained at a higher rate than those students who did not go through the program. In addition, in, once the students enter in the fall, the, 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 the supports remain, there is still this engagement uh, with the students. And we also have now have mentoring programs. Student uh, corporate leaders are coming forward and they're offering students uh, mentoring opportunities to engage. And all of this is at no cost to the student. You know, it's, it's one of those tuition-free programs 
where we evaluate your financial aid. If there's anything that you need after that financial aid, we provide it. We pay for books. And if the students need to stay on campus, we provide housing waiver scholarships, really taking money out of the equation and making sure that students leave that freshman year debt free. So it's really a complete wraparound service of suite of services. Chancellor Salgado, we just heard that Dominitrius is interested in sports management, and I believe she told me she would like to be a coach of some sort, uh, perhaps an educator and a coach. Uh, you found that this is really key to increasing college graduation rates. Isn't that right, to help students keep an eye on an end goal in a career? Yes, um, it's really important whether it's your, or your, your next goal is to transfer to a four-year university or to enter into the marketplace, you know, the sooner that a student has a, a, a sharper idea uh, about where they're headed, the, the quicker they are going to be to set their course taking, um, as well as their experience making, right? Um, and the course taking and the experience making go hand in hand. Um, you know, we've worked very hard to have those relationships with private industry that create work experiences, uh, mentorship, as President Scott mentioned, mentorship experience in the industry, because the student experience has to extend beyond the campus. It has to extend into the communities where these students have uh, a desire to be. Um, and in many cases, it's in uh, the industries that they want to get into. And so we, we too think we have a responsibility. We've been growing apprenticeships and work-based learning as much as we can uh, because we think that's a big part of the equity equation. We have lots of companies making major statements about how they want to be inclusive. This is the opportunity to actually be inclusive. <laughs> Come see President Scott and myself. We can help you make that happen. <laughs> Professor Robinson, we actually received some very provocative questions from our audience. Uh, one member of the audience referenced a, a recent article in the Atlantic about elite, elite private schools, which said, uh, quote, but what makes these schools truly ludicrous is their uh, recent insistence that they are engines of equity and even inclusivity. A $50,000 a year school can't be anything but a very expensive consumer product for the rich. If these schools really care about equity, all they'll do is get a chain and a padlock and close up shop. Ouch. Uh, so what is the role <laughs> of private schools in increasing equity, uh, including, I'm sorry, University of Chicago, where you teach? <laughs> oh, that's OK. I do not take it personal. So it's, it's quite all right to be very critical of private education spaces, because I, I happen to think that anytime you have education behind your name or you, you're, you're focused on educating young people for the betterment of, of themselves and for the community and for society, then you have a larger responsibility than just money. And unfortunately, I think a lot of the private institutions put that responsibility uh, secondary and tertiary or it's, it's sort of lost in where we are as a society today. So I don't think it's just indicative of private universities. I think it's indicative of a lot of different spaces. Um, that combined with the, disin, the defunding and disinvestment of public colleges and universities, uh, right? So what can private universities do? They can make sure that their education is free for all marginalized young people. These endowments are, sometimes in the billions of dollars, right? So if we had the will to make sure that anyone under a certain level of, of family income could, could come to their university and get the same education as someone who has, uh, who has parents in the 1%, then, then we're starting to talk about something, right? I think they're making moves in terms of trying to make sure their graduates are debt free when they leave their spaces, but that's, that's sort of bottom and baseline. I think they can go much further than that. And I think they can start by uh, giving back to their local schools and the communities. Um, I talk about that a great deal with the University of Chicago, located here on the south side of Chicago, uh, and how we should really be investing in the local schools in our community. And understanding um, that we don't, oh, I'm sorry, in understanding that we don't have to recruit those people, recruit students from all these other spaces when there are students right here in our backyard 
who would be so wonderful to have in our classrooms and would benefit everyone else. The whole tide rises. We make sure we're inclusive and that we're equity focused and that we're making sure we set young people up to leave our space with as little debt to zero as possible. Dominitrius, to what extent has paying for college been a barrier for you? I know when we were following you for the documentary series last summer, you uh, went to log on to your uh, virtual classes and realized you weren't in, enrolled because of an error on your uh, financial aid application. Is this a, a kind of constant thorn in your side, filling out these forms? It's uh, somewhere uh, fast, so you know, every you gotta, you know, how many people in your household and stuff like that. That's what gets um, financial aid messed up. And, you know, in city colleges, the financial aid thing, you can't have no mistakes on the application. And that was the problem. Like, I didn't put the right thing in on my application. But my mentor, like, she went back in and she fixed it and it was cleared. Your mentor meaning lady? Um, no, Miss G, the one that's um, working at my school. Yeah, she uh, helped me with it. So, uh, again, this idea of the informal support network uh, helping out a uh, student like Dominitrius. Uh, Juan Salgado, I know you have, I think you said 200 to 450 students per each advisor. I'm sure you wish that uh, ratio were not so drastic. There's a lot that students like Dominitrius are dealing with. Uh, and so on top of her work and her family obligations to fill out these FAFSA forms is a lot of additional burden. What can we do to support a student like Dominitrius? Yeah, so this is, I want to just go back to the work we're doing with navigators because often, you know, the advisors have a defined set of responsibilities um, and, uh, you know, it doesn't always meet the student need, right? Uh, you know, getting into college requires a FAFSA and many other things that you need to uh, do. So what we're doing is just prioritizing um, the the, the deployment of navigators as a uh, additional support to students in addition to the advising work that we're doing. And so we believe that a combination of the two is going to help create a safety net, you know, for students to effectively access uh, education as well as choose the right pathway along that education. And a caring campus is gonna ensure that, um, you know, as best as possible, our students don't fall through the cracks. I know we're getting questions from the audience and I want to turn to a couple of those in a second. First, uh, let's talk a bit about what we can do to successfully move students from college into good paying jobs. President Z. Scott, you say that corporations tend to do all of their recruiting at what you call flagship schools. Which schools are you referring to? Well, I'm you know, uh, we, we're talking about some of the larger, uh, more elite universities outside of Chicago and inside of Chicago, you know, University of Illinois, uh, to, 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 name, to name one institution. However, uh, we are on a path uh, to uh, form a, uh, a center at Chicago State that will better support our students in that transi transition uh, to the world of work. Uh, we are in the process of designing a, a, a workforce center uh, with the support from, from the Civic Consulting Alliance that will strong create a stronger uh, partnership between our students and the world of work in Chicago State and corporate America. Because what we want corporations to do is to ex tell us, tell higher education what the future of work looks like. Make sure that we are preparing students, not for just the jobs of today, that we're preparing them to you know, morph into the jobs of tomorrow so that we are developing and graduating students with a set of skills that will help them move into an identified job. So if a student says, I want to be this, you go to a corporation and say, how many of this major do you need? And what do you need them to be prepared for? Not just academically, but socially as they move into an environment in the world of work. 
And we want corporations, again, to work alongside of us in making sure that our students are prepared for the world of work. But it's just like we, we talked earlier about racism and systemic racism being present in higher education and being an obstacle, we know that the data shows that the moment a black or brown student graduates with a degree and it goes into the job market, there is an immediate gap between what that student earns and what a white male with the same degree and the same experience owns, uh, it will earn. So we're trying to close that wealth gap right out the door to make sure our students get the right wage and they're prepared for the experience. And this will all involve our Center for Workforce Equity. That we have I, I want to follow up in a second about what this means for the English majors of the world. But first, a question from Imani Legrone, who asks, are there specific policies and legislation that should be elevated to support the changes needed in higher education? Uh, Professor Robinson, any thoughts? Absolutely. I think state policy, state governments can fully fund their educational systems. Just, just start there. Start making sure our HBCUs, our HSIs, our city colleges are fully given the resources they need to help all the students they serve. And, and I think that's the very bottom of the basic resources you can give to a university or, or any sort of educational space. Give them the money they need in order to do the work that they do. And then try to create policies and initiatives that support them in the work that they do. If they're looking to recruit more people and more faculty, make it so that it's easier for those folks to do that. We make, the states make it very easy for corporations to be comfortable in their spaces. They, they subsidize them. They, they offer all these packages so that the company feels good about living and breathing and working in the state. Why do we not do the same thing with our educational institutions who are charged with making sure that their thousands and thousands of students feel the same way? And yet education is one of the first line items to get cut in state budgets. So I think that's one of the first things we can do. And I think the public needs to put pressure on their elected officials to get that done. Elected officials are, you know, they're, they're supposed to be working for the people. And if that's the case and people want to see their higher education systems change for the better, then we have to put that pressure and say, you know what, you have to start funding these institutions. There's no reason why uh, some of our HBCUs across the country are struggling financially when states owe them millions of dollars, right? So when that happens, we, we need to take a, a hard look at how we view education in the country, how we really view our priorities in the country, and, and start putting our money where our rhetoric really is. President Scott, you mentioned all of the uh, pre-professional tracks and preparing your students for working, presumably in fields like IT and the healthcare and other sectors that are growing. Is there any concern about not giving them the freedom to choose to study, say, English or art? Um, I'm an English major, full disclosure, and I wasn't really thinking about what I would do with that degree when I was in college. Is this just an indulgence that your students can't afford, or is there a place for a liberal arts education? I think there's a there, there's an appropriate place for a liberal arts education. I think that what I've been I've been told by the, by employers that give me give me your in your English majors, I can teach them to code. Uh, give me your English majors, I can teach them to be in communications. People in uh, those humanity skills that are critical thinking skills, reading, writing team projects. The, I mean, those are the skills that make you bulletproof for the future in the world of work. So I, I think that there is an important place for humanities. And what I would encourage a student who is majoring in, a, in the humanities is to have a minor so that there is something underneath that major that might support them should they need a, a specific skill for a specific job or they have a specific interest. I graduated with a journalism degree. And, and uh, I thought maybe you have an English degree, I have a journalism degree. I thought I was gonna go into radio and television and broadcast, but I realized that in my junior year, I didn't like it. Uh, so I ultimately ended up in, in law school, 
but, uh, but I ended up in the right place. That journalism degree was incredibly helpful to my time as a, as a, as a law student. So I, I would say that there is, there is room for the humanities major. And I, know, I never want to see a, a time when we discard uh, humanities as being something that's insignificant. Dominitrius, you are no longer living in Chicago. Uh, where, where are you now? I'm in Indiana, South Bend. And you went there because you felt like there were more opportunities than there are uh, for you in Chicago. And you, you actually told me you don't see yourself living in Chicago again. Why, why is that? Um, so Chicago, it just became so bad um, after I left. And I just feel like South Bend is a better um, environment for me. Like when I first moved here, I got a job. I filled out a job application. They called me right back. And in Chicago, it's way different. You have to wait like weeks or months to hear back from a job. And I was able to get back on my feet when I got down here. So, Is there anything that anyone on this panel could do that would convince you to come back to Chicago? I don't know. Does anyone have a, a pitch for Dominitrius? Um, yeah. I, I heard some discussion about encouraging corporations to hire your students, uh, Juan Salgado and Z Scott. Uh, and, and when they do so, uh, they're, you know, they're not doing anyone a favor. It's not an act of charity. They're tapping into a pool of talent of young folks like Dominitrius that otherwise they would be missing out on. Yeah, that's absolutely the case, Dan. Uh, they're, they're doing themselves a favor, right, when they tap into that talent, for sure. But I'd say to Dominitrius, um, if you found an opportunity in your field of study in Chicago, right, that attached to sports management, would that uh, entice you to come back? Yes. Yes. We got to work on that. Yeah, definitely. And my, my statement to Dominic, Dominitris, if you found an opportunity to go to, a, to, to attend a college where you felt like you belonged, uh, that you felt like the professors cared about you, cared about your opportunities and cared about making sure that you complete college, a place like Chicago State where 73% of our faculty is minority, so you will often see people that look like you. You will see students that look like you. And we work on having, making sure our students have a sense of, of belonging. Uh, would that entice you back to Chicago? You say to yourself, we, we, we say to students all the time, if you feel like your neighborhood is not a place where you wanna travel back and forth every day and that you really would feel more comfortable on a safe mm -hmm. college campus like Chicago State, uh, would would that would that would that would that interest you? Yes, ma'am. I understand. Did you have a Did you have a twin? Yes. Yeah. Where we is not. She? Uh, <laughs> she at Harris State um, okay. University, yeah. so we not at the same college. Okay. All right. I know we're about out of time. One one last question: Do, do we suffer collectively as a city and a state when we don't cultivate talent like Dominitrius? I think we do. I look at, we, we compare our statistics to the statistics, the st statewide statistics of other, uh, other public universities. Our average ATC to ACT score is 18. The average statewide score for our public is 23. So we, are already, we already understand that there is a difference, not a difference in talent, but a difference in academic experience. And what Chicago State has proven when we graduate one in every, one in 10 black graduates in this state got that degree from Chicago State. That means that we are able to take that 18 and turn it into a college graduate because that experience on a standardized test one day does not define the future of our students. You know, I just gave out the President's Cup Award to a student who came to Chicago State from Jamaica. He came here, he wanted a college degree, He's graduating with a 3.95 average and he's getting a degree in physics and he's on his way to get a PhD at Georgetown in medical physics. That's what happens in Chicago State. We are number two in the nation in graduating black students with degrees in physics. 
That's what happens in a school where you have a sense of belonging, a school that knows how to take care of you, and a school appreciates where you are when you enter an academic experience. It's all about fit. Dan, can I just say, when a young person looks out on our city, right, and sees a hospital, an office building, you know, sees uh, uh, an ambulance go by, they should be able to envision themselves in that occupation. When they go to the United Center, Demetria should be able to see herself working in United Center. And so are we suffering? Yes, we're suffering. In every single community, we're suffering because that student looks out on downtown and doesn't see themselves included because in fact, the systems are set up. Z said it before, they're systems of systematic racism that need to be dismantled opportunity by opportunity. Doors need to open for our students. Chancellor Salgado, President Scott and Professor Robinson and Dominitrius Chambers, thank you all for joining us. And thank you to the University of Chicago Crown Family School of Social Work Policy and Practice and the University of Chicago Inclusive Economy Lab for partnering with us on this event. And as always, thanks to WTTW's members, funders, and partners for their support on this project. And a reminder, you can watch the whole firsthand Living in Poverty documentary series at the WTTW.com slash firsthand and on the PBS app. You'll also find expert talks, including one by Juan Salgado, text journalism, a discussion guide, and more. And thank you all at home for joining us this evening. Good night. <laughs>